Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. At the beginning of this new week, we're going to return to the study that we have been on. We're going to ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance. May we all unite together in prayer because we're going to need his guidance, his watch care, his angels, and his spirit so that what he wants to reveal can be shown to us at this time. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, indeed we thank you for this opportunity to come before you so that we may again learn more of you. Our great need of you, Father, at this time, day by day, hour by hour, and minute by minute, is certain. I thank you for each one that are joining today. We come before you. We ask for your blessing upon this meeting, upon the recording that will go out, so that we may come more to understand that which you would have us to know. As we open your word, we ask for your spirit. We ask for your wisdom. We ask that your angels may attend us. Be with us now, each one. Show us that, that which, need, which we need to understand. Even with our darkened minds, we know that if we ask you for wisdom, you will provide it. So for this, we ask this day. Direct us now. Be with us so that your will is done. For this, we ask and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to segue for just a second into part of what I was presenting yesterday, what I've been led to present yesterday. We're going to address a couple of things. We're going to return to this in Numbers 22. Now, let's see here we go. Now, <clears throat> this paragraph from Review and Herald, June 8, 1886, paragraph number seven, partial, I think is something we're going to have to be considering as we go forward. God holds his people as a body responsible for sins existing in individuals among them. If there is a neglect with the leaders of the church to diligently search out the sins which brings the displeasure of God upon his people as a body, they become responsible for those sins. But this is the nicest work that men ever engaged in to deal with minds. Consider this for a moment, please. I don't want to be responsible for my own sins at times. If we are unwilling to search out these issues, we will become responsible for them. Yeah. And, and for me, um, I mean, this has been the biggest struggle that I've had really my entire life because, you know, I rather just do things on my own. Mm -hmm. And so God has placed me in a church where there needs to be a cooperation. People have to work together. People who are different 
And, you know, some people are more different than others. Some people are very difficult to work with. I'm probably one of them. And um, then when we have, let's say, what's existing in the movement at the present time, I've prayed and studied and worked really with all of my energy, at least as much as I, in my mind, imagine all of my energy, to try to to be reconciled to those who um, I'm having problems with. Because I see that responsibility. It, it's easy just to sort of say, well, you know, these people, this person and that person, they don't get along. I don't get along with this person. I'm just going to stay away from them. And, and sometimes that needs to happen. But, you know, God is wanting to bring this movement into unity. And so there's this individual work that we have to do, which is being united with Christ, to seeing uh, the things in ourselves that are hindering his work. But we know that other people are struggling. And the question is, how do we help those who are struggling? And and even when they're struggling, you know, they're struggling and they may be lashing out against us. Um, you know, what do we do in this situation? So this idea of having to deal with minds um, in contact with others in uh, Ministry of Healing. When I first read that chapter, I mean, it was, for me, a, a revelation. I was a very young man at the time. And I didn't really fully understand all of the differences in people. I probably still don't. But what's happening, you know, in the church, what's happening in this movement, we are, in a sense, responsible. And often what we try to do is to blame others for what's happening and not realize the part that we have to play. So some people think that if I just you know, call out the sin and distance myself from others, that I've done what is my responsibility. But I need to seek how to restore others to be redemptive in how I deal with people that I have conflicts with, whether it's a church, whether it's a movement. And, and so... You know, this is not some simple thing where you just get rid of the people or distance yourself from the people that you think are bad. It's much more complex than that. Right. And Ellen White uses um, the word nice. What she means by nice is delicate, fine, right? It's not right. pleasant. <laughs> She's not using it in the sense of pleasant. It's not the pleasantest, pleasantest work. No, it's not. <laughs> It's very, very difficult and difficult and fine, and um, and that's you know something that all of us struggle with, I believe. Amen. Okay, I agree. Yeah, and at the end of this study, I'm, after we finish recording, I have something to talk about, okay. just a personal situation and. Uh, um, so it does relate to this very point here. Okay. Now, on Thursday, I was not able to join with you. Mm -hmm. Theodore did an excellent job on a moment's notice, <clears throat> being able to go through a lot of points. I'm going to shift to another screen very quickly. I'm going to ask a question that he had asked several times during this meeting because this is going to have a lot of import for all that we're going to be addressing over the next couple of days. So, Here was the, the chart that I had sent up to Theodore. And this is a, a poor copy of what 
Elder Jeff had been writing on his board when he was giving a presentation dealing with the Waymarks on January 31st of 2015. Now, when I look over here to the left, of course, he is showing numbers 22 to 24. He's showing Revelation 9, the seven thunders, Luke 1, 1 Samuel 25, Genesis 41. He's interrelating all of these with the different waymarks that he placed upon this board. He's showing 1989. He's showing 9-11. The Midnight Cry. The Sunday Law. And then we when we come here over to the very end, we're showing close of probation and several things that are beginning as far as notes. Now, <clears throat> there is a main point in this that Elder Jeff at that time had skipped over. What is that point? You left out mid midnight. <clears throat> right. Now, I'm looking at all this. I'm seeing this as a conglomeration of the lines. Some lines he's focused in and he's he is laser finely pointed. Some of these lines he's zoomed out <clears throat> and zoomed out greatly. <clears throat> is it important for us today to separate these lines to come to an understanding of exactly what we should be expecting? Yes. How should we go forward? I'm sorry, I was over speaking, so someone answered. Was that you, Angela? No, I, I said we should, but uh, you guys know a lot more about this stuff than I do. However, one thing I had asked, and either I was too dense or it was just missed, is what does key turned mean? Like I was thinking, is it the key of David? Is it Revelation 3 7 2, whatever? Okay, like, in Revelation. Or is it 2520? You know, like what is this key? <laughs> Okay, in Revelation 9, we have a star falling from heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Is there not a key of the bottomless pit? Oh, <laughs> okay, that answers my question. But what is the key to the bottomless pit? <laughs> I mean, doesn't the bottomless pit have to be opened? Right? Yes. <clears throat> Like I say, I, I was doing this, the, the party that was doing the camera work at that time for Elder Jeff was not very focused about clarity in his videos. Now, <clears throat> I hooked up one of my other external hard drives last evening. I was able to find that Elder Jeff had continued in this presentation when he went to Portola, California a week later. I'm hoping to be able to get some additional clarification on some of the things that he was presenting here. But so far, this is, is the basic framework that he was using in 2015. Now, my question, and I'm sure that each of you have gone through this in the past. Can you separate midnight and the midnight cry? Well, well, they are a doubling of, that's why they're, they're a doubled way mark. Right. But but there is something about that 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 um, I don't think we've fully had 
had clarified, and, and especially later on, because initially when we put the midnight waymark in there in 2016 and we drew it in, uh, and, and, and just to even go back a little bit, I know lots of people know this, but I mean, originally Jeff had 1989 Sunday law close of probation. That was his line, right? Back in the 90s. Exactly. And then once 9-11 came along, um, he moved uh, he moved these around, and he did it in various ways. Uh, but he had eventually come to, by 2015, 9-11 being the first day of the first month, uh, Midnight Cry being the first day of the fifth month, and the Sunday Law being uh, the 10th day of the seventh month, October 22nd, right? So he was lining those up in that way. And, and that's what you kind of see is sort of this remnant of this line. That's why you see 1989 on, on the left still. Um, and then after the Sunday law, you're going to see the close of probation. Um, but in a sense, it's already he has these lines mixed up. And what he never knew is that when he started to um, zoom into these lines, he, he didn't recognize what he was doing that he was actually zooming into a way mark on a bigger line. And, and sometimes, you know, he would zoom into, let's say, the Sunday law way mark, 1989, 9-11. These are all actually zooms, zoom into a way mark on Alan White's line, right? But then we start zooming into um, <coughs> each of these lines. We start to break them out. We start to see more detail. But as you noted, he's he's kind of has this conglomeration. He has some that are zoomed out, that he's he's placing lines over top of each other, that actually are are not don't really go together. I mean, they illustrate the same thing, right? But in that line, it's not really part of um, of they shouldn't all be together in this way. At least that's what I understand. Okay, now. There was a presentation that he gave about 40 days later. Mm -hmm. And this would have been in March of 2015. It was interesting. And this, this I think, supports the point that you're making. Because when I look at this... second... board that he was putting up mm -hmm. he was attempting to do the two sticks judah and joseph mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was then underlaying that with the last seven kings or this the seven persian kings that we've been addressing but he was calling them the seven thunders mm -hmm. But he also included Ezekiel 37 as being a part of all of this that we're addressing in Numbers. Mm -hmm. When I'm looking at this, my, my first thought and there, there are going to be those that think I'm absolutely bonkers for saying this. I see spaghetti. I see all sorts of strands intermingled. You don't have an idea as to what's going where. It's all a jumble. But every part of this has an interrelation to that which we're studying right now. Mm -hmm. and, and just to comment on that. So Stephen's study uh, yesterday was really important. His order out of chaos okay. um, idea. Because uh, what he was suggesting, I mean, I don't think he developed it, but he, he shows all of this, all of these lines and how there's all these structures, these wheels within wheels, really. Um, 
he doesn't he, he doesn't have the time or take the time to to put them all into their context what the significances are of these things i mean so we we have one diagram after another and of course i understand them really well i'm not sure how much people were going to retain from that but it was very important you know what he showed us but then when he he moves into the the study of trump um, and, and I'm not sure what his intention was. I think what he's trying to say is that, um, you know, somehow with, with the failed Trump prediction, there's something about this past history, uh, specifically about what happens with the siege when Egypt comes. Um, and that would somehow parallel uh, what's happened with uh, the Democrats, the globalists taking over America. Um, Though I'm not sure exactly how that parallel works when you when you look at the story, but the idea that we're in the siege, I de definitely already had marked in 2019, and and this is something that Colin had had understood back in 2019 as well. So Colin was working on understanding the tenth day of the tenth month and the relationship of the siege to what was happening in this movement. But but part of what what happened is that we still haven't sorted out these lines properly. And um, <clears throat> mostly what we are seeing happening with all of these dates and symbols, that this relates internally to the movement, that it's not meant to help us make a prediction about what's going to happen externally. External events will witness to our lines, but these external events are not something that we are to predict right and and so this becomes a problem with the trump idea because if we understood where trump the part that trump had to play and he still plays as far as our internal lines are concerned specifically even the prediction about trump is something that's about our internal lines and so you know that sort of was not it wasn't presented whether Stephen understands that and whether he was just trying to avoid some things. Um, you know, he, he's less direct than I am when it comes to things like that. But because um, there definitely is stuff in what Colin has done that we and what Odilio has done, that we, we, we just don't reject it. The thing is, we need to understand it. And and I think it's still the same problem that we see here. The problem is we don't we're uncertain about what line we're looking at and what it's witnessing to. And and I think the thing that comes from our experience as we continue to go through these lines is a sorting out of this spaghetti, as you call it, so that we can lay it all out and it can be very, very clear. Right now it's just all in a jumble. Well, one thing that came from what I had looked at in the second presentation that was still available is this portion of the line. I mean, the fact that there's Judah and Joseph for the two sticks, great. Mm -hmm. But when he put this portion with the kings of Persia on the line, mm -hmm that goes from Cyrus the Great to Cambyses to False Smyrtus to Darius the Great to Xerxes the Great. We have been placing Trump as Xerxes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which means that Darius would be Obama. Yeah. Which means that False Smyrtus <clears throat> would be Bush. Yeah. The second, yeah. And which means that Cambyses would be Clinton and Cyrus the Great would be Bush the first. Where's Reagan? Well, he's also there at 1989. Okay. But, but these are the Persian, these are the Persian kings. And and um so we know that Reagan um when the way that we line them up, I mean we, we don't we look. We line up Reagan with uh, Darius the Mede. Okay. Now, 
so. <clears throat> which is fine. Hmm. But this then, in this line, we have Cyrus the Great with the first decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. We have Darius the Great with the second decree. Mm -hmm. What decree did Xerxes give to rebuild Jerusalem? Well, he did nothing to be rebuild Jerusalem. Okay. After Xerxes, Elder Jeff noted Artabanus. Mm -hmm. And Artabanus by the world is not looked upon as being a king. Right. He's just a placeholder. Okay. So if this goes from Trump, this then would be Biden. Which yeah. even, even the far left socialists <clears throat> have admitted that Uncle Joe is nothing more than a placeholder. Yeah, he's, he's just a puppet. Now we come to Artaxerxes, and of course, Artaxerxes is the one that issues the third decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Right. Is it not important here for us to recognize that two decrees have been given and that the third decree will be given? Right. Now, so here, here is the problem. So when we look at the Sunday law and we see that the story of Xerxes, Xerxes has a type of the Sunday law in it, right? Right. So we know that that story uh, with Esther illustrates the Sunday law. But yet that Sunday law um, isn't happening with Artaxerxes' decree where you would expect it to occur, right? So if you take this line here um, of the three decrees and you parallel it with the three angels' messages, then it doesn't make sense that you have this Sunday law after the second decree but before the third decree. Right. But when we studied this, what, what we, we found is that this is our movement that's being illustrated. Exactly. Right? It's, it's, it's illustrating the pandemic. It's illustrating all of these things. It's, it's typical. It's not really part of the big line. That is, the story of Xerxes is not the story of the three decrees. It's a story of an internal line that's, that's related to the big line as a symbol. It makes much more sense now that I hear it like that. Yeah. So when we look at what hap is happening under Trump, this is, this is this history in the story of Xerxes. We've already, Stephen illustrated it as well. And so we can see that the pandemic is, is related to that. What we haven't really sorted out is, um, and, and we looked at it, we, we looked at that the three angels' messages are there in the story of Esther. Right. But we haven't really understood how that relates to this movement and what it means about this movement. This movement is something that um, happens after 9-11, because really the second decree is 9-11. So there's, there's problems I have with how this is lined up. That is, 9-11 um, is Darius. Okay. <clears throat> All or or at, least, at least connected to it. The, what <clears throat> happened after 9-11 maybe is a better way of looking at it. But 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel's message. And, I'm and not, we're gonna, and I'm we're not see under, under, what's that? I'm sorry. I, I was interrupting. Okay. Go ahead. So, so we see that, you know, 9-11 happens. It's under Bush, false smirtis. Remember, false smirtis is the one who's going to bring an end to the building of the temple. Right? Right. And then Darius comes in and he commences that work, or it commences under his time. It actually commences without him. That is, it's the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah that commence that work. And then, um, and then he's going to allow it to be completed. 
right? Because it's going to basically be um, four years from the time that he comes into power to when he actually issues the decree, if I remember correctly. So he issues it in 516 and he comes into power in 520. So, so anyway, the point is that if that's Clinton, what you're going to see is you're going to see all of these things that occurring between 9-11 and the Midnight Cry are illustrating to some degree what's happening with um, this movement. And so we haven't sorted that out yet. We haven't really understood how, if the second decree is Darius, how Clinton fulfills that role. Right? We look at, you know, his taxation and all that type of thing. But there's obviously some, some other thing that's oh. involved. Okay. Darius can't be Clinton. Oh, it's false murders that no, you're not Clinton. I meant I meant Obama. I said Clinton. Yes, you did. <laughs> I meant Obama. <laughs> not, okay. Yeah, so Obama. But yeah, it, it doesn't I mean the, the situation yeah, is Cambyses, so that's way before. Right. Yeah, so this is Obama. So you have Obama. Don't know why I said Clinton, but anyway, you have Obama. What happens under that under that that king has to be illustrated with the second decree as well. Okay, but see, here's here's the thing, and this this is what makes it interesting. Okay. What's one of the biggest things that Obama pushed forward that was completing of something that Hillary Clinton wanted finished well i mean all i know universal for, uh, yeah, universal obamacare uh, yeah the obamacare right i'm not i'm not even considering that okay some other thing yeah okay i don't know much about what uh clinton wanted finished uh i mean maybe i don't know having to do with islam is there anything to do with islam or I don't know. You you tell us. <laughs> okay. Well, just say it. <laughs> I generally do. <laughs> yeah, but it takes you a minute. Thank you. Okay. The situation here is Obama was the most gay friendly president so far installed in the White House. Okay. Now, the one thing about this is that gay marriage became more legitimized under Obama. Mm -hmm. As we are addressing the situation with Balaam, as we're going to be returning to in a moment, as Balaam chose to follow after the emissaries of Balak, the first situation happened <clears throat> that his ass was turned out of the way. Right? Mm -hmm. The second situation that occurred is they are going down a path between vineyards and the vineyards are protected by walls. Mm -hmm. What do those walls represent? Marriage and the Sabbath. Right. Balaam's foot is crushed against a wall. Marriage wall. That's my premise. Yeah. So here's just, just a thought. Now, when we look at uh, this history, so we know that the Israelites come out of Babylonian darkness right, out of captivity, and, right. and, and this is a very literal line. I mean, they are coming out of captivity. It's not in symbolic in that sense, right? It, they're, they're ending their captivity. There's going to be uh, what happens with the fall of Babylon, then Cyrus rising to the throne, then him issuing a decree, and then you're going to have this very direct attack on the foundations, right? The work of right. the enemies is very, very literal. 
with false smyrtus and and through that time you know canvas these false smyrtus and and then in the time of drys you still see the work of the enemies continue and then um but there is a message that's given which is to continue building this temple and Darius is going to confirm that and then you have this story in the history of Xerxes that I believe represents this movement after 9-11 and then it's going to come to Artabanus and so this is a new history this is something that's in a sense temporary right what right. we see in the United States, but it's still the end of the United States. And as far as our lines are concerned, as far as the symbolism is concerned, Trump, well, he still is playing a role prophetically. But as far as being Xerxes, he's defeated by Greece, right? Right. But then you're going to have this third degree, which is Artaxerxes. Now, in this line, in, in the history, this is something that is positive. But in our history... This is the dissolution of the United States. It's right. not the building right. up of the United States. So, so it, it is a mirror to what happened in the past, at least as far as how it unfolds, what it's doing. It's destroying what was built, not building something. Yep. So when I was looking at this from 2015, mm -hmm. there's a lot of points in this that are going to have to be separated as to the line that relates to the movement, the line that relates to, let's say, the, the corporate church. Mm -hmm and the external lines mm -hmm. when these are separated we should be able to come to a much clearer understanding about why we are seeing so many symbols that will interrelate with ezekiel 37 with numbers 9 with all of these other points so that we can begin to make sense and be prepared to give a message with clarity to the world. Yeah. So Jeff was given all of these wheels, yep. right? Correct. But we have to fit them together. Right. Right. These are like wheels or cogs or whatever in, in, in a, a watch or some kind of machine. A and watch they all have to fit together and they need to to work, right? A watch would be a wonderful example. Yeah. Now, uh, just another point that um, sort of seems unrelated, but the, that line at the top, the, the joining of the two sticks. Right. The line for Judah and the line uh, for Joseph, which is Ephraim, right? Northern and Southern Israel. Now, we know that these lines are the 22520s in the past correct and these two sticks are joined now what what jeff tends to do here is he kind of joins them at the ends to make a longer stick um and i'm never sure why he did that whether it's just what he assumed but the idea is that these sticks are actually bound together that they become one stick instead of two he thinks of it as you know one longer stick but the idea is they're they're actually strengthened. When you bind two together, you make it make it doubly strong. Yeah. Amen. Actually, more than doubly strong. Yes, true. Yeah. Okay. And so um, instead of instead of end on end. Exactly. Instead of what? In. That's it. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, please. Uh, instead of end on end, you you put them. Okay. Flush together. Yeah, okay. Now, so we know it's the two 2520s. Now, the two sticks do join in our history. So back in 2015, because Jeff was just developing, at least I first heard of this joining of the two sticks. Uh, how, when he first introduced this, I don't know. Um, but we were dealing with um, the, um, the, oh, what is it? Uh, 
word isn't, escapes my mind. Um, the image of the beast test, that's what it is. So, so Jeff was talking about how there's this image of the beast test that's going to precede the mark of the beast test, if you want to put it that way, that, that there's going to be a forming of the image of the beast, and then we have the Sunday law that follows. And, and I asked him a question in an email. I said, you know, when does um, the image of the beast test occur? And he said, at the joining of the two sticks. And I actually wrote a paper on the joining of the two sticks. So I have, you know, studied into this to some degree. But in, in trying to understand this, what I see is that this is talking about how the Protestants who see the coming Sunday law, who see that the Pope is the Antichrist, who see the the joint the 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 um, the image of the beast test, they're going to see it and they're going to pass that test and they will join us at the Sunday law. And so so there's something here that you know that Jeff is is sort of marking. He's putting the line of Judah earlier, and I'm not particularly sure, but but when we have the line of Joseph or Ephraim, northern Israel, the Protestants, um, he's going to have this happening, um, at, you know, not at the Sunday law. It's going to be in connection with the midnight cry, and you can see this illustrated here. But part of the problem there is we have this whole other line then, right? So each of these lines... You know, how we look at what's happening with the Protestants, how you Breaking look at what's up. happening with with um, awesome. with the movement, with the church. And, and with yeah, you're breaking the up, Theodore. Okay, yeah, my internet connection's unstable again. Can you hear me? How are you hearing me, Dwight? Uh, five by five, you're coming through very clear. Yeah, yeah. that's on Theodore's name then. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, you know, this. OK, are you back now? Am I back? No. OK, this uh, yeah. both of these charts. I mean, I, I've done everything I can to try to read as much as I can about this off of the screens that we're showing from Lambert Community Church. Mm -hmm. Now. The. Portola meetings that went on a week later, Jeff begins to do these one line at a time, not trying to do these as such a, a, a conglomeration as he did at Lambert. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start going back through those Portola meetings as I have a few minutes and then see exactly what else can be, can be derived from these. Okay. So, so the one thing I think is that we need to go through numbers uh, 22, 23, and 24. Yes, I agree. And, and, and finish those off rather than going back to Judges chapter 11. And, and one is because we can start to see quite clearly how these relate to our line and what's happening in the movement presently. Agreed. Okay, now the thing that, that I'm intrigued by and I, I think I said this when we started in Numbers 22. When the translators were breaking this down, they came to verses 1, 2, 15, and then to verse 22 as the next subject break. So Numbers 22, 22 becomes intriguing. But where I recall us leaving off was about Numbers 22.15, so bear with me, please. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. Who were the princes that were sent by Balak to Balaam? What tribes were they from? Does anybody, does anybody remember? I don't. Okay. <clears throat> we step back for a second. 
And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. So you have Moabites and Midianites. And where are they going to seek to tempt Balaam to come to their aid? Where is Balaam living in a general sense? Well, he's living in Syria. <clears throat> well, when I've looked at this in the, uh, I believe, both in the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, does mm -hmm. it not say that he lived in Mesopotamia? I thought when I read it in the Spirit of Prophecy, she said Syria, but because um, he's he's going to be he's going to be right on the borders of Mesopotamia. Okay. But technically in Syria, where he's located. Okay. Um, but yeah, so he's in that land, but he's technically in the land of Aram, which is Syria. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I was looking at it being that here is a former prophet of God living in Babylon, being called out of Babylon. OK, if it's Syria, fine. Well, it, I mean, it could be uh, I mean, you could look at it as Babylon as well. But just the location of that place seems to be Syria. But anyway, let's say it's let's say it's Babylon. That's fine. OK. So you have the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian that are being sent to Balaam. Are the elders of these two tribes agreed in the work that they are to do? How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Is that not correct? So are these elders of Midian and Moab confederated in their goal to bring Balaam to Balak? Yeah, it would have to be. Thank you. <laughs> and just to comment on this, this is actually from the Bible. Okay. Uh, when uh, Balaam's giving one of his oracles. Yes. And he said, uh, and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, come curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. So Aram is just Syria. Okay. Right. So he says personally, He's being brought out of Syria. Okay. So just, yeah. And, and I had actually read it when I was reading in the Spirit of Prophecy. So that's why I said she said it. She doesn't, you know, say Syria and she doesn't uh, say it herself. She's just quoting what uh, Balaam says. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And they came to Balaam and they said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. Come now. I need you. Don't delay. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. <clears throat> And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak. These are not emissaries now. They are being seen as servants. The elders of Moab and the elders of Midian. So you have those that are direct descendants of Abraham that are the Midianites. 
you have the descendants of Lot, which are the Moabites. They are now said of being that they are the servants of Balak. If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or to do more. What is Balaam doing here? What kind of... Uh, he's saying that he's enticed by the offer of maybe silver and gold in a house, but he says, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord. When I'm looking at Numbers 22, 17, I'm seeing something that to me doesn't make much sense. I will promote thee unto great honor. And then it says, Sorry, I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Well, if you're going to take a subservient role, how can you promote somebody else of the great honor? I mean, <laughs> to me, that doesn't make, really make much sense. Well, they're, they're quoting Balak because <clears throat> as, we, as we look at this, thus saith Balak. For Balak has stated, I will promote thee unto very great honor. And I, Balak, will do whatever you, Balaam, say unto me. Therefore, come, I pray thee, curse me, Balak, this people. Does that, does that make any other sense? Yeah, it does, but we know it's, yeah, he's really pushing it. It reminds me of Herod. I will give thee the half of my kingdom. Okay. So, <clears throat> my question here again. Here's Balaam's answer. He says, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or to do more. Is he speaking the truth? At that time, yes. But. Sounds lukewarm to me. Thank you. Is he not giving lip service to his relationship with God? Well, if we go a little further, we <laughs> see that it's given that lip service. But right here at that line, um, I don't see that in that line. Okay. But as we go further down, I see it. Okay. Yeah. So where the heart is far from God. Yeah, so there, I mean, it's it's kind of strange with Balaam, because, I mean, he can't curse them. So, and, and he is communicating with God, right? Yeah. So, it, it, you know, it's kind of bizarre in that way. It's not like, I mean, he's he's not just going and saying whatever he wants. <clears throat> um. He's saying what God tells him to say. And the question is, why is he doing that? Okay, so he's telling the emissaries, I can't go beyond the word of the Lord my God. Right. Yet, he tells them, now I now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. Mm -hmm. Will say unto me more. Would this indicate that he's already been told of God specifically what's going to happen? And he wants to go again? How would you take that? Well, well, here in in this case, in Numbers twenty two, I mean, yeah, he's he's trying to, um, I mean, he's trying to manipulate God to some degree, and, and this is this is before his oracles themselves. This is just about <clears throat> even going to see, to, you know, to prophesy against Israel. 
you know, to curse Israel. But um, is, he, is he manipulating God alone? Well, no, he's not, he's, he's a manipulator, but um, and 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 you know, God tells him that he he shouldn't go with them unless they come to him. But of course, oh, no, that's he, the second group. That's the second group. Yes. Oh, oh, he says if the men in well, verse nineteen, right. So twenty two twenty, the God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. And then Balaam's going to get up in the morning, saddle his ass, and right. he's going to go with them. But it doesn't say that they came to him. Okay. And my understanding is they don't come to him. He he goes to them. So he right. doesn't follow what God says. <clears throat> okay. My fault. And I'm sorry for any confusion that I may cause. This is the second group of emissaries. Mm -hmm. Now, spirit of prophecy is extremely clear. God, in a vision, tells Balaam, if this group of emissaries comes to you in the morning, you may go with them. Mm -hmm. Balaam wants the offer. He wants the inducements. He wants the honors. But he is playing both. He wants, he wants to play that he is this prophet of God. He wants to, he wants to play that he's able to curse this people. When he's been told specifically by God, you're not going to curse them because they are blessed and they are blessed. Where else did we see this comment made within scripture? Was it not when Esau returned to his father? to be blessed when he found out that Jacob had been blessed and had taken the birthright so the emissaries are told tarry here this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more he's already been told what's going to happen mm -hmm. god came unto balaam at night and said unto him if the men come to call thee rise up and go with them but yet the word which i shall shall say unto thee that shalt thou do <clears throat> so in twenty two twenty. The line is given. If the emissaries come to you in the morning, go. If they don't, don't. But what does the next verse tell us he was doing? And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Spirit of prophecy said he saddled his ass and went after the princes of Moab. Now, in the verse <clears throat> and God's anger was kindled because he went. Was God righteously upset with Balaam. Mm -hmm. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. Okay, so, so just a question here. Um, well, first we know that Balaam represents the United States, correct? That's the way we're approaching it, yes. Yeah. 
And and so, you know, if we're we're making that application, um, United States is the false prophet. And there's a message that God has given them. There's something that they have um, that um, gives them direction and guidance. And, and that would be like the Constitution and the Bible because they're Protestants. Right. Okay. Now, so there comes a point where the United States goes against, even when they're trying to um, do, in a sense, what they think God wants them to do, right? They're going to say what God wants them to say. Um, and that would be, so let's at least just um, for a minute think about this possibility that this relates to what happened in the 1980s with Reagan and the Pope in going against communism. I mean, maybe this parallel is not, not correct. I don't know. But the United States knows what its role is, but it's seeking to um, defeat an enemy or something, a perceived enemy, by not following the counsel of God. Correct. Okay. And and this is going to lead to our history. So this is going to be illustrating our line. So I think in Jeff, in placing the story of Balaam where he does, must be correct in that context. If if Balaam is represents the United States, Protestantism. Now we still have the issue of why why is he riding upon an ass and some people may not agree with me on this point but one of the things that i've always seen um is that that the soviet union or russia is closely connected to islam okay that's interesting well, I mean, there is a connection, right? They border different Islamic lands, border on the Soviet Union, yes. Yeah, and and its culture has been influenced to a large degree by the East. There's lots of similarities in culture. Yes, there is. Right, so so there are things that, that, that come. I mean, there's a mixture of things. I mean, you couldn't say... Islam is equal to to Russia or the Soviet Union. No. And but we do also know that part of what happened in uh, the 80s was the war in Afghanistan. Exactly. Right. So so there's something about this ass or Islam that the United States is riding. There's some relationship there that existed. And, and this is partly so. I mean, and I'm not saying the Soviet Union represents Israel either, right? I'm saying there are some parallels here. There are some things that don't fit, so I'm not sure how to to answer them. The United States uh, supplied Islam or with weapons. Yeah, we know. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So and you got Syria too. Possible. Syria too is a proxy war too with Syria. Yes, right. So, so there's something here that, that you know, there are things here that to me fit and things that don't. And, and Miller's Rule says that, you know, you have to have everything fit. But maybe there's some way that we're not looking at this correctly. Of what it, why Balaam is riding this ass. And it may have to do something just simply with prophecy that the ass represents the prophecy regarding Islam. Okay. But it's an interesting right there. Yeah, so these are just thoughts, but, you know, the question is, why is he riding the ass? What what does him having been called to curse, um, you know, Israel, what would that have to do? I mean, in a sense, we would also say that Israel can represent uh, the United States as well. So, 
so there, there's something going on here that I don't think we've quite sorted out yet. That's my main point. Well, <clears throat> there's one point that I have often said, I've had, I've literally had friends get angry with me and no longer talk to me because of this point. Mm -hmm. But Barack Hussein Obama was America's first Islamic president. Mm -hmm. America was closely joined with the ass at that point. Now in 1989, America was closely joined with the ass because America saw its enemy as being the Soviet Union. What is being said right now by Artabanus that we have in the White House Mm -hmm. is that Russia is our great enemy. Mm -hmm. We, in this example, need to be looking at this line as to how it applies within the movement currently. We're going to be able to look at this as to how this applies with America. But that's an external line, right? Yeah. So I think we can, we can make the applications, the external applications, much easier at this point than we're going to be able to make the internal application. So we're gonna to have to take a little bit of time to really consider what's being presented here. <clears throat> now, we are applying that Balaam is representative of the United States, correct? Mm-hmm. What are the two servants that are with Balaam? If Balaam is the United States. Okay, good question. Are the two servants republicanism and protestantism? And that and that's definitely something that I I I think I suggested that, but at least I thought it. Um what else could they be? I, I don't see that they could be anything else. I mean, it, it could be that they just symbol the sec, uh, symbolize the second angel's message, but um, I think it's more likely it represents the, the two horns of the United States. Okay. What about the ass? Um, it can see, but Balaam can't. It sees through the smoke. Okay. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting as we go further into this that the ass is able to see and God has to open Balaam's eyes. Now, if God has to open Balaam's eyes, then what phrase can we apply to America? Well, America's blind? Spiritually blind. Yeah. Uh, makes if, sense to me. Okay, now, if, if, if America is spiritually blind, what phrase can we take from Revelation 3 that would apply to America at this time? Are they not Laodicean? Well, I mean, yes, but Laodicean does refer to God's true church. Right. 
right? So it doesn't really refer to Babylon, which the United States has become a part of. Is becoming part of. Yeah, okay. At one point, this was the land of promise. This was a protected land, a land protected by God. Mm -hmm. God's hand is being removed. Why is his hand being removed? Because of the abominations that are seen within the land. Yeah, and we can definitely see when we take the story of, of Balaam and we see how what happens to the rebellion of Baal Peor, right? So, I mean, this God removes his protect, protection because Israel is sinning. Right. So, I mean, and that's the suggestion that Balaam has. Um it's not quite, when I read it in the Bible, it, it's not really as clear as I thought it would be of why, what happens at Baal Peor, that it was connected with Balaam. But, you know, he said basically that, um, from what I get from the spirit of prophecy, that if you're going to have them be cursed, they have to, be, they have to sin. So right. it seems that he actually suggested this plan, but it doesn't seem that the Bible says that explicitly, but Ellen White does. Oh boy. Yeah. I get the point that Ass is trying to show Balaam the way. Who who now is trying to show the states the right way? To answer your question, sister. I think that the state is so focused on what it wants to do that it's not willing to be shown the right way yeah and i think i i think that it's the, the ass symbolizes the the prophecy of of revelation 9 right so what what's showing the united states what's speaking is prophecy in this case right and, and even though we have the ass speaking and we say, well, it's the Sunday law, it's really the prophecies that are speaking at that point. Does that help to answer your question, sister? Um, yes, no. <laughs> okay. Agreed. There, there's a lot of this that we're going to have to examine in a lot of detail for us to be able to understand questions like what you just asked. And it's going to become clear as we get through specific portions, not only in this chapter, but in the next chapter. Okay. Uh, Theodore related the ass to Russia. Could Russia be trying to get a message across to the states of what is happening? Well, okay, so so the thing that's in my mind is that you you have you have two nations or two systems that are opposed to the United States, and in some ways they're opposed on valid grounds. I mean, when you call, when Islam calls uh, the United States the great Satan, are they wrong? When they condemn Hollywood, are they wrong? No, they're not. Not really. No. no. When Russia stands up against homosexuality, is Russia wrong? No. 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 So, in a sense, these these two powers, Russia, which is has some of the symbols of Islam to it. And, and the Islamic countries, Muslim religion, are really standing in opposition to the immorality that exists in the United States. Say that again. 
these these the Russia and Islam are standing against or speaking against the immorality that's in the United States. Yes. Yeah. I mean, their solution is not the Constitution, right? They have different solutions. Um, but still, they're speaking against it. And, and see, part of the problem with the United States is we have this Constitution, we have this freedom of speech, and, and the founders were uncertain whether the Constitution could even stand, whether this republic could stand, because it required um, the taking of responsibility upon those who are the members of that country. That's correct. Right. So you, you couldn't just have a, a republic and have immoral people um, and the republic stand. You have to have uh, morality. You had to have people who believed in the Constitution and practiced yeah. the principles of the Constitution. And the United States has departed from, the, from morality, you know, for lots of different reasons, lots of different areas. And so... Well, they don't really think they are those that advocate have vocate for certain things they don't think they're in the wrong they think everybody else is yeah you know and the funny thing about protestant america i mean there are people who stand for the constitution and stand for god who actually are completely ungodly in all of their actions mm. you know in their lifestyle their drinking their, their entertainment um, how they think about others, the type of character they manifest. It's definitely not Christ-like. And yet they stand for God in the Constitution. And I find that kind of odd um, about Americans. But um, no offense, Americans. I'm taken. I'm taken. <laughs> it, just, it just seems odd to me. Well... Um, in, in this situation, on the surface at least, Islam and Russia are fully agreed. Mm -hmm. Because in, in this with Islam, what is the way, the manner in which open, homo open homosexuality is treated under Islamic law? Kill them. Exactly. It doesn't matter if it's man to man or woman to woman. You're found in a homosexual relationship, you're killed. In Russia, homosexuality is still very much underground. But it's also underground. Uh in the Islamic states as well. To uh, a point, I, yes. It is. I mean, it's there. You know it. Exactly. Now, in this, they see the abomination that's occurring within the United States. So, Theodore's point, may be very correct. Now, the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. <coughs> and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. Balaam striking the ass is a response, a metaphorical response to the action of the ass. The following verse, but the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall being on that side. The spiritual application that I would look at here, as I said earlier, here is Balaam on the ass, 
there's vineyards on either side and the vineyards are being protected by the walls. The vineyards representational of doctrine is being protected by the two walls. And I would ask if the walls are not the marriage relationship and the Sabbath relationship. Well, we, we surely know that uh, the marriage relationship is one of them because of the studies that we've had on this. Um, and uh, this, this Sabbath is one of the biggest issues in the world. So it makes sense uh, that those two things are the things that, that protect the vineyard, the doctrine, the wine wine source well, well second to the separation of church and state protects that but are not the walls that god provided in eden marriage and the sabbath the walls that are intended for our protection Absolutely. Does uh, Sister White give us any illumination on that? I believe she does. I'll see what I can do to come up with some of this for tomorrow's meeting. Okay. Um, I see this, this comment in the chat, but I don't know what USSC is. the u.s oh that's the u.s supreme court sorry i didn't realize i'm still muted okay sorry all right <clears throat> now we are now at eight o'clock mm -hmm. we're going to have several things we're going to have to be able to discuss tomorrow are there any other questions or comments regarding what we've been able to cover today. Just lots and chat. I didn't quite catch that. I said just lots in chat, but you might have already read it. Okay, well, what, what I've seen in the chat, I'll cover this quickly. Xerxes' great decree to rebuild rather than protect Jerusalem could be allowing the Jews to defend themselves during the death decree. Then, rather, I said rather or rather than, I need to look at that. Okay, Xerxes doesn't have a decree to rebuild. I don't understand that. Yeah, that's why I said rather protect because the Jews had to protect themselves. And since he couldn't rescind his law, he just said, okay, you can defend yourselves when the death decree is passed. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Well, the death decree happens after the close of probation. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the thing about the story of Xerxes is it's out of place. If we're going to put it in with the decrees, the story of Xerxes doesn't fit there. And so it must be typical of something happening in this movement that's typ that is also typified. So I put the story of Esther, Samuel Snow's letters, our history as a typical history that occurs uh, under the second angel's message that illustrates something that's going to happen in the future within that line. And where you have the Sunday law really in in the line of the three decrees is the fourth decree with the story of nehemiah where the sabbath becomes the issue that's going to be the parallel to the history of the sunday law and in artaxerxes 20th year so uh, we're misapplying this xerxes to um i mean the the Esther law uh, of defense in this line is what you're saying. I'm just saying it's not a part of that line. It illustrates the Sunday law. 
and it occurs under the second decree, right? Right. After Darius's decree. Right. But it's not, it's not, if you take the line of the three decrees, you don't have the Sunday law after the second decree before the third decree. Correct. Right. So, so it's out of place. That's, that's in that sense. But it's okay. typical of something which also exists in Samuel Snow's history and Millerite history with Samuel Snow, and also exists in this history with this movement. And because we do have a Sunday law or a type of the Sunday law in this movement, that's the pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic is an example right. of it. Right, and it's a typical Sunday law, just as the story of Xerxes and Esther is a typical Sunday law. Now, it's illustrating, all of these types are illustrating something that's going to happen after the third, you know, after, after the Sunday law in the United States, even after the close of probation, right, the death decree. That's something that happens during the time of Jacob's trouble. Which is down the road still. Yeah, well, after the close of probation. So, um, so we're illustra this movement is illustrating something as well. And, but it's just you have the three decrees. The story of Xerxes isn't, in a sense, a story of the three decrees. So, it's like an ad hoc. It, it's it's an internal history that occurs. Mm -hmm. That's typical, and and it's illustrating our history. Right, not not an external history. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. But I mean, it, it ultimately is going to apply to the external history at the end of the world, but it happens internally first within the movement. Right. Okay. And it's witnessed too by external events. I mean, one of the things you see that's quite kind of interesting is was we talk about the Sunday law and Trump and all these things. But where do we really see the spirit of the papacy exercised in our history? Isn't it within the movement itself? Uh, yeah, because yeah, I don't August see that 29th, much activity outside. But I do want yeah, August 29th, 19 could be the start of that. I mean, it's very evident then. Mm -hmm. And December 6th, 2021. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so thanks, Dwight. You're going to have to close with prayer. And... Okay. We thank you, Father, for this time that we've been able to spend together. We thank you <clears throat> for the thoughts, for the considerations, for the contributions of everything that went on in this study. I thank you for each one that have given their contributions and ask for your blessing upon them this day. Be with us now. Help us to carefully consider these points so that when we return again together, we may be able to go forward to consider further points that are interrelated to that which is occurring within this movement and within this world at this time. Direct our steps today, be with us so that your character may be fully revealed to those with whom we come in contact. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. amen.